I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, we have some really interesting topics today. It, it, you know, some that I kind of never really thought of, to be quite honest. <laughs> well, you know, some of them are good and some of them yeah, oh, not God, so, good, so good. But, but, uh, yeah, but we do. Excitingly, today we have a new guest that's going to be joining Dr. Matt Springer. Uh, Matt's going to be talking about chronic wasting disease here in a little bit with a special guest from um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Then we have Dr. Jonathan Larson here. Go and give us an insect update as well. Um, and we love having Dr. Larson here. He's our resident entomologist and always a um, great guest and a lot of good information. And then we've got a um, black walnuts, a tree of the week this week. So a lot, we're getting a lot of questions. Um, black walnuts losing its leaves this time of year. So lots of questions about that. Is it normal? What's going on with it? So um, we'll We'll, we'll address that as well, but we're delighted to have you all with us today. You can interact with us via the chat pod in Zoom, or if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we'll get to you there. But Renee, glad to be with you and glad to have everybody with us today. Definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. So Dr. Springer, you're already on and I greatly appreciate you joining us. And you know, there's something serious going on, sounds like. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, unfortunate for the topic, um, because this is one that we we're uh, we didn't want to have to deal with in Kentucky for as long as possible, uh, and that's chronic wasting disease. Uh, and I did jump the gun a little bit, but I just went with it there at the get go. So I, I figured I was just so excited to to try to get this message out to folks because it's it is a big concern. It's a public health issue, uh, and I've I've got a great guest here to talk about it with uh, soon to be Dr. Nelson. Uh, who is the DEER and CWD coordinator for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, she's going to be able to give us a little rundown about the state agency's um, kind of attack plan uh, that went into effect last year and, and moving forward. So, uh, Noelle, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Absolutely. Are you guys ready for me to share my slides? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Appreciate you having, having you on the show today, for sure. Of course. I'm excited to tell you a bit about First, I'll go into a little bit about chronic wasting disease um, and what we're doing as a state agency um, and what the future is going to look like. So um, chronic wasting disease is a neurological disorder or like a, a brain disease. It's in the same family as bovine fungiform encephalitis or what you guys know as mad cow disease, uh, scrapie and sheet and creutzfeldt jakob disease in humans. The disease agent for chronic wasting disease is the prion and these prions um, are just a misfolded protein that all of our bodies make. These prions can be spread directly between deer. Um, so just rubbing, nuzzling, um, mating, the rut season, um, and then also through the environment. So they shed these prions through their saliva, their antler velvet, their feces, their urine, their blood, you name it. So these prions, these disease agents that cause chronic wasting disease, they create holes in the brain. And basically the deer just become, they start wasting away. They lose regular ability to do regular functions such as eat or drink. Um, they lose fear of humans, uh, other predators. And this disease, why it's the biggest threat to North American wildlife conservation is because it's always fatal. There's no vaccine and there's no treatment to date. So as a result of chronic wasting disease, you'll start to see deer looking like this. And these are all confirmed cases of chronic wasting disease in various states throughout the, United, um, throughout the US. So in the Midwest, um, we have really high population turnover, which means, um, you know, where in Wisconsin and Illinois, where they've had the disease for over 20 years, we may not be seeing a lot of clinical deer like this. Um, you know, hunters may say it's an invisible disease. We're just not seeing the sick deer. And that's because population turnover is so high. Um, you know, deer are having fawns early on. Um, and then they're also, they're dying from vehicle collisions, hunting, predators, um, before they even reach these clinical stages. Regardless of if you're seeing sick deer out on the landscape, you're going to see long-term population declines, which we're already seeing in Wisconsin and Colorado for mule deer and white-tailed deer and elk, um, and lower age structure. So we're not going to see those large adult bucks anymore. The disease will, um, you'll start to see clinical signs within about two and a half years of initial um, infection. 
Um, and once they start showing clinical signs, they usually don't make it past six months. That's if they make it to the clinical um, stage of this disease. So in, in Kentucky, we've been doing surveillance for an awfully long time, um, and we really ramped it up this past year based on Tennessee's detections near our border, which I'll get into with our uh, surveillance zone in the next few slides. But six of our seven bordering states have chronic wasting disease, so we're, we're in a pocket in this um, Midwest area, Southeast area. Um, and we see additional states coming uh, popping up with chronic wasting disease uh, more frequently. So we have North Carolina, Louisiana, um, and of course, Mississippi, um, all coming up in the last few years. So we have a statewide surveillance system for chronic wasting disease. Um, and you can see just our, our 2022 um, kind of quota for how many deer we want tested for chronic wasting disease in each county. And this is based on a multiple of risk factors. So this is the county's distance to an infected state. So you see that our border counties have higher um, number of deer we need to get sampled, but it also accounts for the number of taxidermists and processors in that state, the, if there's high deer density there, um, the number of captive cervid facilities there, and various factors like that. Um, and we work with Cornell and New York. Um, they have a multi-agency uh, project set up that helps states identify um, surveillance needs each year. Um, and then we can, we'll zoom in on our five county um, surveillance zone, which is nearest the Tennessee detections. But first, a lot of ways that we get our CWD samples um, is through these, this freezer program. So throughout the entire state, um, you'll see this map down here, our locations of our freezers where hunters can drop off their head to get sampled for CWD um, at any time during the hunting season. They're available from the very first day, so this Saturday. Um, and this map actually isn't updated. We already put out four more um, across the state. So we're really hoping to um, make this a more popular option, especially as hunters realize that the risk of CWD is here. It's at our doorstep. It's eight miles from our border. Like I said, um, Tennessee had two recent detections extremely close to our border. In September of last year, they detected it within 7.8 miles um, of our uh, Callaway County. And then a little later in the season, over six, a little over 16 miles um, from just south of Graves County. So whenever um, CWD is detected within 30 miles of our state, we create um, or we activate our response plan. So this created a five county chronic wasting disease surveillance zone where we heighten surveillances and put in regulations to help prevent the introduction, slow the introduction um, and slow the spread of the disease within our state once it gets here. So these five counties are Callaway, Marshall, Graves, Hickman, and Fulton. In these five counties, there's no baiting or feeding of wildlife. There's no taking out full carcasses or high-risk parts such as the spine or intact skulls out of the zone. You can only take out deboned meat or finished taxidermist products, uh, clean skull plates or antlers. Then we also will have mand mandatory check stations during weekends of modern gun season. Um, so the first weekend is going to be Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the second weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then that third weekend will be Saturday and Sunday. And that's where um, we will have 14 check stations throughout those five counties where you have to bring in your deer uh, to get checked and tested for chronic wasting disease. It was a huge success last year. We had 17 check stations, so we're just doing a, a few less. Um, but we had hunters come, you know, even when they didn't harvest a second deer, they would just come to talk. They said it reminded them of the good old days, how they used to bring their deer in person um, to get checked in. Um, they would bring us food on holidays. We worked on Thanksgiving and multiple hunters and their families came back to bring us food. Um, so it was a really, it was a great experience given the terrible circumstance. So last year, um, like I said, we heightened our surveillance. We tested over 7,500 deer. Normally it's a little over 2,000. Um, and we tested 55 elk in our Eastern Kentucky area. CWD was not detected in any of those deer, which is great. 
Um, over half of those, so over 4,300 of those deer came from our five county Western Kentucky CWD surveillance zone, which is really awesome. And again, chronic wasting disease was not detected, which is a little uh, mind boggling knowing how quickly deer move and how far they can move and knowing it's that close from our border. Um, so to the top right is just a general idea. These are mostly roadkill um, or sick clinical deer that we tested for CWD where we have actual points from. And you could see just how many deer came out of that five county area in the very western part of our state. And then at the bottom right, um, we were taking one mile grid locations um, from the hunters that came in and checked their mandatory deer uh, to get an idea of just how, how much area we're recovering by testing for chronic wasting disease um, with these hunter harvested deer. And you could see that we covered a lot of area with the darker colors, meaning more deer got taken out of that one mile square. Um, so this, the circles indi indicate a 10 mile radius from that Tennessee detection that was nearest our border, and then 30 mile radius, which indicated our management and our surveillance zones. And we far surpassed our sampling goals for those areas and feel pretty confident that if the disease is in our state, it's um, at extremely low levels. And I would really like to take this opportunity to answer any questions. I know there's a lot of misinformation about chronic wasting disease, so I'd love to kind of do some myth busting um, any chance I get. Um, so yeah, that's what I have and thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so very much for uh, joining us today. And you know, one thing I'm sure people are wanting, are wanting to know is like, well, if I accidentally or eat a deer with this, is it gonna hurt me? Right. Um, Matt, do you mind if I take it? Yeah, go for it. Um, so they have been, there's actually one study in mind where a hunting group in New York, I think this was in the very early 2000s, um, had kind of a banquet situation and they all found out a couple weeks later that they ate infected venison. Um, so they've been kind of doing a long-term study, checking in with these hunters um, and so far, they're all okay. I mean, there's never been um, transmission to humans of chronic wasting disease. However, we do see in some studies that um, macaques and other primates have gotten CWD from eating infected meat. So, you know, we don't want, CDC recommends that hunters do not eat CWD positive meat. So we say the exact same thing. If there's ever uh, a jump between the, the barrier, the species barrier, um, mutations may occur. We don't want that to be with our Kentucky hunters. We don't want them to be the first one to get chronic wasting disease. A, a lot of the concern is based on uh, the issues that happened in the UK with uh, bovine, uh, with mad cow. That one, there were folks that did develop issues. Um, so because these are so closely related and we have a version of the 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 uh, problem in humans, uh, there's a, a real safety um, component there of just we don't want to screw with it enough to find out if it can or cannot. Uh, unfortunately, um, with its prevalence in the West for um, upwards of six decades now, uh, there are folks over there that have been consuming positive uh, animals for probably quite a while. Um, and, you know, the, the real cutting uh, edge experts in, in that field of study are, you know, we're going to find out is kind of how they put it, because um, there are enough folks out there that are, are consuming meat, um, regardless of, of whether they know it's positive or not. Uh, and over time, we'll find out. And, and hopefully it, it remains that it doesn't ever jump. But, you know, Matt, that brings up a question that I've had. Um, Noel, you had mentioned how many you all have tested for this. I was just curious, what percentage of all deer harvested is that? Or do you have a, a, a guesstimate, I guess? I was just trying to get a sense of how many more are out there or, or annually harvested, I guess. I, it's an extremely low or, um, testing rate, probably less than 10%. Oh, wow. So we're harvesting a lot of deer in Kentucky. <laughs> right. You know, it was only mandatory testing in that five county area during our early and late muzzleloaders and our modern gun. So that's only a small portion um, of the state and only some of the some of the season. So we're really hoping that that'll increase and a lot of people will get their uh, deer voluntarily tested. Yeah. There was a couple of questions that snuck in, and one was um, to ask you to kind of what was the the I guess causal agent they had missed that at the beginning. What's causing this to happen? And then there was a question about kind of do you have an opinion on how prevalent it is in Tennessee as well? 
Yeah, um, it's caused by a misfolded protein called a prion. So it's um, your body makes these proteins and it just so happens that when one converts to this misshapen version, it causes this neurologic disease. Um, and so for deer, it was caused by a bunch of deer um, being in an area that held sheep with scrapie. So those sheep got taken out of that um, pen and they thought everything was fine. They put some deer in later on um, and they all ended up getting the disease wow. and then it got into the wild deer. And that was out west. Was that like patient zero out there for, we think for chronic wasting disease? Yeah, wow. absolutely. Um, and as for Tennessee, um, their website is a great resource. They have extremely high prevalences in some areas of their Southwest um, area of the state. Um, and it's, it's popping up in other counties. So definitely take a look at their website and stay up to date with that because it continues to spread. Okay. Well, hopefully we can keep it out of Kentucky as yeah. long as we can. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, get that website and throw it in the chat there uh, after we're done here. So. That'd be great. All right. Well, thank you both for joining yes, us. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any more questions, but we greatly appreciate you giving us an update on that. Um, and if, if something happens and we need to get more information, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll, we'll get it out to folks. Yeah. Thanks thank so much. You, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Springer. Noel, thanks for coming on. We'll have you back again. All right. So uh, moving on, um, you know, a lot of people have been calling about black walnut. And something's wrong with it. So they're losing their leaves. They're right? losing their leaves. It shouldn't be happening. This is just uh, August. Well, it's almost September, but it's just August. Uh, so what do you think's going on? Well, I think there's a couple of things that are going on. And um, you know, we're gonna have the tree of the week is on the black walnut. We'll speak about that a little bit, or Laurie will. Um, but generally there's a couple of things. Um, walnut by its nature is one of those trees that is kind of late to leaf out and early to lose its leaves. So part of this is just the normal cycle. We also have some kind of diseases that are out there. Um, there's a walnut anthracnose um, that can cause on the leaves, it gets on the leaves and then can kind of expedite those falling a little earlier than they would. So um, it's probably a combination of just normal, you know, this is just time to the season for this to happen. Right. And also maybe a little bit of that, um, that leaf disease out there expediting it in some locations so um, yeah. it, as far as we know I've not heard any widespread concerns like oh no you know the walnuts we do have um, you know thousand cankers disease which is the biggest known kind of threat to walnut right now um, mm -hmm. but I've not heard of anything new popping up or causing any issues with that so as far as I know right now we're still just kind of it's normal with our walnuts. It just kind of happens. Um, if they fail to leaf out next year then we've got some issues but um, hopefully they should all leaf out fine. All right. But, you know, that's another example of, you know, we getting some calls and so we're going to put it on the show. So, again, if anybody has anything that they've seen, let us know and we might, you know, put post it on the show for you. Yeah, no doubt. So All right. Let's I'll learn a little it. bit of, more about Black Walnut. All right. I'll get her going for us. OK. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the Black Walnut. Black Walnut, Jugulans nigra, is one of the most prized and valuable of North American hardwoods. It's also called Eastern Black Walnut and American Walnut. It's a medium to large tree that typically grows 70 to 90 feet tall and 2 to 3 feet in diameter, but can grow up to 150 feet tall and up to 8 feet in diameter on really good sites. In a forested setting, it develops a straight trunk with a narrow crown. It's a relatively fast-growing tree that reaches maturity by about 150 years, but can live up to 250 years. Black walnut is highly valued for its wood as well as its fruit, the walnut, which are enjoyed by wildlife and humans alike. Black walnut is found throughout the eastern United States, from Vermont to Minnesota, south to Florida and Texas, and it is a common tree in Kentucky. It thrives in deep, well-drained, neutral soils that are moist and fertile. It can be found in fields and forest habitats. Black walnut is a shade intolerant species and must have direct sunlight to grow optimally. Black walnut can be confused with butternut or white walnut, also called white walnut, or the tree of heaven at a glance. Black walnut is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. 
The leaves are compound, which means each leaf is comprised of numerous leaflets. And with black walnut, the leaves are pinnately compound, which means the leaflets are arranged on each side of the leaf's central stalk or rachis. The leaves are large, and they're usually about 12 to 24 inches long, and made up of about 10 to 24 leaflets. The leaves are typically missing a terminal leaflet, or if it's there, it's poorly formed. The leaflets are serrated, and the leaf stem or rachis is stout and pubescent or hairy. Fall color is not particularly showy, and leaves drop quickly in the fall. Black walnut is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are single-stemmed, drooping catkins that are about 2.5 to 5.5 inches long. The female flowers are on short spikes near the end of the twig. The flowers develop in spring between April and early June, depending on latitude, and they emerge with the leaves. The flowers are wind pollinated. The fruit is an edible nut that's enclosed in a thick semi flesh round green husk that's about two to two and a half inches in diameter. Inside the husk is a furred hard shell that contains a sweet edible nut or kernel. The fruits are born singly or in groups. The fruit ripens between September and October. The husk typically softens and turns dark brown to black as it ripens, and the fruit drops after the leaves have fallen. Good seed crops are regular, possibly twice in every five years, and large seed crops do not occur until trees are 20 to 30 years old. Black walnut is primarily regenerated from seeds that squirrels have buried and failed to recover. The seeds typically germinate the following spring. Black walnut is a valuable wildlife food due to the nutritious fruit. Walnuts are eaten by a variety of animals, including squirrels, raccoons, bear, and turkeys. The leaves are not considered a great browse species for most wildlife, but they are somewhat palatable to white-tailed deer. The bark of black walnut is brown to dark brown to gray. It is divided by deep, narrow furrows into thin ridges that roughly form a diamond-shaped pattern, particularly on younger stems, as you can see in the photo. Thousand canker disease is a threat to black walnut. It's a disease complex that's native to the western United States, but it's spread east. The disease causes leaf yellowing and wilting, branch dieback, and general decline. And once a tree starts showing symptoms, it may die within three to five years. The disease is caused by the combined activity of a fungus, Geosmithia morbida, and the walnut twig beetle, a small beetle native to the southwest. The beetle carries the fungus and spreads it to the walnut as it burrows into the branches to feed and reproduce. The fungus then infects the tissue, destroying the vascular tissue and causing small black lesions called cankers to form at the beetle entry points. Eventually, these cankers merge together and they girdle the branch, which prevents the flow of vital nutrients throughout the tree. The walnut twig beetle has expanded both its geographical and host range over the past two decades, and coupled with the fungus, walnut mortality has occurred throughout the West, including California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. In July 2010, thousand canker disease was first reported east of Knoxville, Tennessee, and um, in Richmond, Virginia in 2011. Black walnut wood is heavy, strong, and highly resistant to shock, as well as being rated resistant to decay. The sapwood is nearly white, while the heartwood is a light brown to dark chocolate brown, often with a purple cast or streak. It's normally straight grained and easily worked with hand tools. When the wood is finished, it has a beautiful, smooth, velvety surface. Figure grain patterns such as curl and crotch and burl are prized for their beauty. The wood is used for lumber and veneer, and fine furniture, interior paneling, gun stocks, and specialty products are made from the wood. The nuts provide food for wildlife and humans and can be used in baked items, candy, or ice cream. Black walnuts are not as readily available as English walnuts, which is the tree the bulk of our food grade walnuts come from. The ground shells provide special products, including nut shell blaster, which was used to clean airplane pistons during World War II. The ground shells are used today to make products to clean jet engines. They're used as a filler in dynamite and as a filter agent for scrubbers and smokestacks. The national champion black walnut is in Westmoreland, Virginia, and it's 246 inches in circumference, 104 feet tall with a 56-foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion is in Greene County, and it's 205 inches in circumference, 118 feet tall with a 90-foot crown spread. 
If you'd like to know more about Champion Trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about black walnut. Black walnut is a favorite host tree for mistletoe. Mistletoe is a plant parasite that lives in the tops of trees and takes water and nourishment from its host tree. Black walnut is known to exude from its roots and other plant parts an allelopathic chemical called juglone, which is highly toxic to other plants. In essence, it excludes other plants from growing underneath it. Native Americans used the nuts for food and extracted a black dye from the roots. The black walnut is mentioned in many Native American creation myths. Black walnut's scientific name juglans is from the Latin jovis and glans, which means Jupiter nut, and nigra is Latin for black, referring to the bark. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the black walnut and get an opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or your neighborhood and enjoy the beauty and the bounty of the black walnut. You know, I'm surprised at all of the things that you can do with black walnut. That's just amazing. So I understand why so many people are concerned about their walnut trees dying. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, you know, Renee, throughout the state, we have a lot of plantations of black walnut that folks have planted and, that, and they're concerned about them as well, for sure. So, you know, if, if you think about black walnut, it's so important, but it's kind of rare, really, in our woods. It makes up such a small fraction of the total tree volume that's out there. You know, that volume is really dominated by our oaks and hickories and maples um, and yellow poplar. But um, so walnut's really valuable. There's just not a lot of it. And that's part of why it's so valuable valuable um, is because of a scarcity issue. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool tree though. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, you know, we our next topic is something that I really never have thought about. And <laughs> I guess I probably should have, you know, other than mosquitoes, I know that they like to find me as food because yes. if there's one mosquito in a 50 mile radius, it'll find me, you know, but um, we have Dr. Larson on here and if you could join us. Hi, good morning, how are you? Oh, so far, so good. I'm sorry. I was trying to wait out the ambulance driving by. I don't know if you oh, can hear that. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what happens when you're on UK campus. Yeah, one of the okay. joys of working near a big medical center. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But you know how insects find food is nothing. It's something I've never really thought about. Usually they're, I always figure, well, they're looking at me as food. So, so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's absolutely bit. an interesting topic. I was yeah. intrigued when you asked me to speak about it. I know it was sort of prompted by a, a press release where we had some researchers from UK, our Department of Entomology, that were talking about their research that's on this very topic. Dr. Syed, uh, upstairs on the third floor, he is doing a lot of research on ticks and how they find their hosts. Uh, very interesting stuff. His research is, is very insect behavior focused. I should say tick behavior focused. Mm -hmm. uh, he knows everything about tick brains. He, he talks about how big their lobes are and stuff. It's kind of sci-fi <laughs> crazy stuff for a humble country entomologist like myself, but uh, it, it's really fascinating. But this is, it's a very fruitful area of research, how insects actually find their food. So I'm going to try and go over a very broad overview of this. It's going to be kind of a bird's eye view of exactly what's going on with them. Uh, I picked up some pictures and I'm just going to try and show kind of what the whole process is like. I think it's really fascinating. I, I remember learning about it and insect plant relationships. And if I had to answer the question, how do insects find food in one uh, word, it would be antenna. Their antenna are the main thing that they use to locate stuff that they want to put into their mouths. Uh, antenna are amazing sense organs for insects. They're attached to their heads. All insects have a pair of antenna. We can see two different kinds here on the front of a weevil and then on the other side on top of our mantis head here. She is not eating her own antenna. She's actually cleaning it off. And I'll talk about why she has to do that here in a moment. Now, these antenna, they are primarily there to help the insects, for lack of a better word, smell the world around them. If you look at an insect's face, you'll notice that they lack the distinct profile uh, of a man like myself. They do not have the nose there on their head that's going to help them to smell. It's uh, This sense falls down to their antenna. Antenna can do some other things. They are touching organs. They can use them to touch things in front of them to better understand sort of spatial awareness, similar to what people talk about, I think, with cats and their whiskers. 
Uh, insects also, in some cases, use these antenna to hear. Insects don't have ears as we understand them. Some species do have sort of an eardrum, a tympanum that's along the side of their body. But for other insects that lack that, their ears are essentially holding their antenna out and the, the vibrations of sound that go through the air will make their antenna vibrate. And that's how they hear. It would be very different uh, in comparison to the hearing that we're used to. But these are all things that make antenna so amazing and so wonderful. But their primary job is to pick up chemical signals. Uh, they can come in many shapes and sizes. If we look, this is the most common and most basic type of antenna. It's called a filiform antenna. If you've seen any insect, it's very likely that you've seen a filiform antenna. It's just a series of almost canister-like segments that are stacked on top of one another, and they extend out from the head area. If we were to zoom in close enough on these antenna, you would see what you see on the right here. These are some scanning electron microscope images of an insect's antenna, and you'll notice that they're hairy. They look like they're covered in these little short spiky hairs. If we zoom in even closer at the base of these hairs, there's a little pit that the hair is inserted into. We call these sensilla. It's not a real hair. It's a chemical receptor that is attached to the insect's antenna, and it's there to pick up all of the various information that's floating in the air around the bugs. So I'm just highlighting that this is the most basic arrangement that they can have for this. But insects have all different kinds of antenna. Uh, sometimes antenna help us with diagnostics. They help us to figure out what insect we're looking at. So if we look here, this is the head of an ant. And all over her geniculate antenna, also known as elbowed antenna, you can see chemical sensing hairs here. Uh, the ants are going to use these to pick up various trail pheromones, to smell one another in the colony and understand, oh, hey, yeah, we're part of the same team, or you're actually a sneaky invader and I need to chop your head off and throw your carcass outside as a warning to others. So it's it's a very important antenna and they use them, they extend them a lot and they're, they're quite active with them. They're elbowed so that they can kind of bow them up like you see here and fold them up if they need to fit through different areas. Uh, I think that these antenna are very helpful in identifying ants. Most ant species, the females, are going to exhibit this type of antenna to help you separate it out from other things that we confuse for ants, like termites who have more filiform antenna. So sometimes antenna help us while helping the insects. Other times the antenna are very indicative of certain sort of biological traits that we associate with specific groups of insects. Uh, when we look here, you're looking at uh, two different kinds of antenna. One is called aerostate on the left here, and then the other is called cetaceous. These are associated with insects that are fast flyers. Uh, these are smaller antenna, more compact, closer to the face. Aerostate antenna look like a balloon. Uh, and then on top of the balloon, there's kind of a feather that pokes out. And then if you look at the, the cetaceous antenna on the other side here, this is a giant water bug. I think I always joke that it looks like the, like the first mustache a 13-year-old boy tries to grow. It's just these two hairs that kind of poke out from the face uh, right near the eyeballs. Both of these kinds of organisms are fast flyers, so they want to reduce drag. They don't want big, showy antenna. They want it as small as possible. But even in these situations, there's still a lot of chemical reception that's occurring. The feathery part on top of the air state antenna, all of those hairs sticking off the feathery uh, portion, those are all chemical receivers. The uh, cetaceous one on the right, those two hairs are each chemical receptors. So they're not doing as much chemical reception, but they're still able to detect pheromones and all these different smells. There are some antenna that I would say are kind of more extravagant in comparison to the basic filiform antenna. Um, two examples of this that I like to point out are called serrate and lamellate antennas. We see both of these frequently with beetles. Serrate meaning saw-like, which you can see on the left here. The antenna, instead of being a canister, the segments now have sort of a tooth that projects off of one side very similar to a saw blade. Uh, the other side here, we have lamellate antenna, which are filiform at first, and then terminate in these, I, there's people call them different things. Some people call them fan-like, 
Uh, other people call them fingerlings, which reminds me of potatoes. Uh, I always sort of equate them to pages in a book because they can close these up, but then they can open them up. And now they've got three things that are sensing and are kind of expanded out. These lamellate antenna are very common on scarab beetles. So if you ever look at a June beetle or a Japanese beetle or a green June beetle, you will notice that they have these lamellate antenna. So these are pretty cool, pretty extravagant, but there are some that are even bigger and, and more showy. These are the real show-offs of the antenna world. We have pectinate antenna, which are sort of comb-like. You see them on this click beetle here on the left, where you have these thin parts of the antenna that project off the head, but then each segment of the antenna has this huge comb-like bristle that sticks out. And then plumose antenna, which look like feathers. This one is on a luna moth looks sort of vaguely like a big ostrich feather or peacock feather that you may collect. When you're looking at these, you're seeing these big projections coming off of sort of a center area. If it's pectinate, it's off of one side. If it's plumose, it's off of both sides, giving it that feather-like appearance. Now I was going to ask Billy and Renee, after going through all these antenna, uh, which of these do you think, one, which is your favorite and which one would you want to have on your head? And then also, which of these do you think are best at picking up the most chemical signals? <laughs> I want the one on the right. It's just is too cool. Yeah, yeah. you want you want feather like. OK, yeah, yeah, I like the feather like one, but I don't want it on my head. <laughs> no, you know, I, it would be some extra management like this is some this is some uh, hair styling kind of thing that you'd have to do in the morning. Uh, you'd go. probably have to brush them back. Maybe uh, <laughs> people would know when you were angry because your antenna would probably pop up. Uh, there's there's definite drawbacks to having big showy <laughs> and like this. But uh, what about in terms of which of these that I've gone over do you think pick up the most signals? I would feel like my fair faucet feather like hair. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I would think too because there's there's more of it. That's precisely right. There's more antenna here. There's more surface area here, and that means that there's more surface area to have those sensilla, all these sensing hairs that are picking up more signals. So when you see these kinds of extravagant antenna, it's usually an indicator of species that are kind of spread far apart in a landscape. Luna moths, for example, are, are quite famous for being rare-ish uh, in most areas. And so it can be hard for a male to find a female to make the next generation of luna moths. So he has these huge antenna to detect the sex pheromones of the female moth. Uh, similar with the pectinate combs over there, kind of a mating process. But yeah, there's more surface area here, so you're able to pick up more information. This can be used sort of intraspecifically for the insects to talk to one another, but these are also absolutely integral in finding something that is food for that particular species of arthropod. And I'm going to kind of break this out into herbivores, parasites, and decomposers. Each of these are detecting different kinds of signals, but ultimately all of them are using antenna or sensilla bearing structures to figure out which direction they need to go in order to find their food. We're going to start with the herbivores. Herbivores are able to detect uh, plant volatiles, sort of secondary plant compounds in some cases, other times just alcohols and things that leak out of the plant as it grows. Some of these we can detect, things that you enjoy as sort of pleasant scents like citrusol, uh, things that make flowers smell nice. Those are volatiles. They're chemicals that leak out of the plant, out of the fruit, and we may enjoy some of them. Others we can never detect. They're just the things that are out in the air and nature that we're not privy to. We don't have the right receptors for them. But these volatiles can do a ton of different things. Some of them allow the plant to talk to other plants. I know that that sounds sort of crazy, like I'm talking about those big talking trees from Lord of the Rings, but plants are able to send signals to one another, which in a sort of pop sci way is the talking plant hypothesis, this idea that they can convey information from one plant to the next. They elicit responses in each other. Other volatiles are all about recruiting pollinators. Some of them make fruit like the raspberry in this image smell good so that a squirrel wants to come and eat it. And then therefore the squirrel is going to disseminate the seeds after it defecates them out. Others are all about recruiting soil-borne microbes. And others are things that they would prefer probably not to leak out. They are signals that tell insect herbivores, oh, that's the plant 
that you're supposed to eat, or that's the plant that you're supposed to lay your eggs on. These can leak from the leaves, they can come from the fruit or the flowers, but the, the plant can't really restrict them getting out into the air and floating around and being detected by insects. These volatiles will sort of come into contact with an insect's antenna, and then in most cases, the volatile induces a specific behavior in insects. In most cases, it's host orientation. So they're flying around, the wind is hitting them in the antenna. There's all this volatile chemical information. In this example on the left, we've got corn volatiles, tree volatiles, and then uh, sort of ground cover volatiles. They're all bashing into the antenna. One of these is going to elicit a response in that moth that says, oh, that smells like food, let's fly towards it. And I don't want to make this sound like a conscious decision on the insect's part. It's much more of a plug and play kind of thing. That, that chemical hits them, that causes a cascade chain reaction in the insect where they will orient their body towards that smell. Once they arrive in the area where the, cell, the smell is getting stronger, there's going to be all these other cues that tell them what to do next. There may be another chemical that induces them to land. It may be more of a visual cue, which we'll talk about in a second. And then once they actually touch the plant surface, there may be a chemical that they receive in certain sensilla that says, oh, let's take a bite. And then there's more chemicals in the bite of food that they take that says, ah, yes, this is good. We should continue to feed. It's all this chain reaction that happens because of the chemicals that plants produce. Then most cases, these are just sort of out in the atmosphere. In other cases, insects can sort of induce them. A famous example of this is Japanese beetles. These are invasive pests, very famous for feeding on hundreds of species of plants and attacking the leaves. They attack the flowers and the fruits and they'll chow down on them. They like walnuts, like we were just talking about. Uh, they like birches, elms, lindens, a lot of our different fruit trees, grapes, roses. All the people listening and tuning into this have experienced this before, most likely, where you have these green and orange bugs that show up and they eat everything before you can get to it. The way that they do this is through using these really sharp mandibles that you see in these close-up images on the right. Uh, in letter C there, they're still attached. In letter D, they've been removed to kind of show those sharp incisor-like mandibles. This lets them slice through leaf material, but leave the veins behind. That causes that skeletonizing that they're most famous for. It lets them bite into unripened fruits, lets them chew up and pulverize flowers. As they do that, there's a chemical that will start to leak out from that damaged area, and that gets into the atmosphere. And it actually is a way for Japanese beetles to find where each other are in the landscape. This is a really fascinating scenario, I think. Uh, there's people that have that they will argue, oh, you know, you can't squish a Japanese beetle because it brings more beetles over. And that that's a fallacy, actually. They don't have an aggregation pheromone. They don't detect one another uh, like that as adults. Instead, they find each other by sort of following the blood in the water like a shark does. These damaged leaves are leaking out all these volatiles into the atmosphere. And this says, oh, my goodness, there's a delicious plant covered with my, my conspecifics, my, my relatives, my, my relative bugs. I need to go over there and see what's going, going on, what's happening. Uh, initially, these beetles, they find one another, usually with a sex pheromone. Virgin females that emerge from the soil, they produce, it's a called virginal sex pheromone. Uh, that name, I think, is a little outdated, but basically it's saying they haven't mated before. Males will swarm the females in the grass. If you've ever seen these clusters of Japanese beetles down in lawn turf, that's what's happening. Is she's just emerged. The males were kind of flying above, and they're like, holy cow, and they dogpile on her. And after they mate, she returns to the soil and lays her first clutch of eggs. The reason they want to mate with her is because it's sort of guaranteed paternity. I assume she's very upset about having just dug herself up out of the ground, having to go back down. But after that first mating, that stops. She doesn't make that pheromone anymore. And so they use these damaged leaves in order to have a beacon to find others. So they know where to eat and they know where other males and females are because they will mate multiple times throughout their life. So this is the only way for them to be able to be successful at that. There's data that shows damaged leaves recruit 10 to 20 times more beetles than undamaged ones. The volatile that leaks out, it, it smells delicious. It brings all the bugs to the yard basically to, to misquote a famous song. These damaged leaf 
volatiles that are leaking out. They come out around 12 to 1500 hours in the day, which also happens to be peak Japanese beetle flight and mating period. So they have adapted to use this to find not only their host, but one another. Other times insects rely on aggregation pheromones in order to know where their hosts are. Uh, this is a true instance of that. Unlike the Japanese beetle, the striped cucumber beetle that you see here, they will land on plants and as they feed, the males release this pheromone that says, hey, cucumber party, cucumber beetle party over here, uh, come and eat on these leaves with me and then let's mate afterwards basically. And they use these pheromones as, a, as an aggregation thing. So they overwhelm their host. Their, their numbers are just so high, they can overcome any defenses that the host has and they're able to, to feed with abandon basically. So there are plant chemicals that are leaking out. There are bug pheromones that are being used. All of these add up to insects, herb, insect herbivores being able to find their favorite food. It isn't just about the smell though. There are some visual elements to host finding. Uh, some insects are capable of detecting stressed plants. We find that spotted and striped cucumber beetles, as well as squash vine borer and a few other species, they more often are attracted to the color yellow than other colors, that even green, which seems to indicate a plant. They see yellow as an indicator of a weak host. So they're more frequently uh, able or more frequently found on traps and other things that use the color yellow. Uh, I will say the color yellow looks different to insects. On the left here, you're seeing a simulation of insect vision. Uh, on the far left is what we see with those black-eyed Susans. But then that right-hand uh, side of that image there, that's what insects sort of see. There are nectar guides that show pollinators where to go in the center of the flower. But there's also color variation that shows this is a plant. Basically, insects are flying above the landscape. They're detecting those volatiles, but as they're sort of flying down, they need to be able to tell where to land. They don't want to waste energy if they don't have to. So in many cases, they, they can differentiate between green and brown, which means green is probably the plant and brown is probably the soil underneath. Uh, then you get more fine-tuned things like the yellow uh, host-seeking behavior, but they are able to differentiate these things. So there's contrasts visually that they pick up on, and then they use more chemical cues to kind of really hone in on where they want to go. But I'm guessing Renee didn't ask me on to just talk about how these herbivores do it. I think that specifically she wanted to know about how her her favorite supervillains, the mosquitoes, it sounds like perhaps nemeses uh, is a good word for them. Exactly. <laughs> how do they exactly. find people like her in the landscape? She's not yeah. wearing a sign Right. You don't have a shirt on that says I love mosquitoes. Or anything. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still able to locate her. It's very similar process, honestly. The difference is in what is being detected, but they're using volatiles that we emit and they're able to orient themselves towards that to get to this behavior you see in the GIF here. The most obvious volatile that humans and other animals emit is carbon dioxide. As you breathe, you put this CO2 out into the environment. It is true that CO2 is everywhere. There are background levels of it constantly, but when you breathe, you create a plume. You create a higher area of concentrated CO2 than that kind of background noise. And the mosquitoes are able to pick up on that. They can do this from as, as far away as 160 feet. They're able to say, oh, something is breathing in that direction you are upwind of them and your CO2 is kind of trailing back to them. The mosquitoes have these plumose antenna that allow them to be able to detect this. The females use it to find CO2. The male mosquitoes, they use it to find the females. The females are the only ones that bite in the mosquito world. The males are vegan. They feed on flower nectar. So once this female has made this detection with her plumose antenna, she is going to switch flying modes and kind of go in that direction. Once she gets closer to that, she's going to be able to detect some other cues. This is, I think, a very handy graph that was made uh, by a researcher a few years ago that shows this whole process, kind of. So mosquitoes are out in the environment. They're buzzing around. They're just kind of going in zigzags waiting to hit something. They want to get a detection of CO2. Once that CO2 hits them, they're gonna orient that way. As they get closer to you, they're able to detect skin odors that say, okay, 
that is definitely a host. The most common one that they detect is lactic acid which comes off of us during moments of high exertion. If you've been working outside or jogging, your skin produces a lot of this lactic acid odor. Now they know exactly what to go towards. Their vision tells them that there's a contrast between you and the landscape around you. And then they have heat receptors that say, oh, okay, that's actually their skin. They're able to tell where you're warmer or colder, and they're going to go towards those warmer spots because there's probably more blood there. And then they're going to land. And there's some other receptors that they have that help them to find your blood capillaries, uh, your, 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 your circulatory system. And then they'll plunge that mouth part in, inject their saliva and begin to feed. So there's lots of data that they're picking up and differentiating between in order to be able to find you. Other ectoparasites like bed bugs, which we see on the left, and ticks, which we see on the right, exhibit very similar host finding methods. Bed bugs can smell when you breathe, they can smell when you lie down, and then they can actually sort of tell when you've gone to sleep. Uh, there's changes in moisture and breathing rate and CO2 production, and they know it's safe to come out and start to feed on you. Ticks, they have very similar, they're able to detect since uh, on the tips of their legs usually, they're able to detect CO2, and they know to begin their questing behavior. All of these different signals basically say, hey, I'm full of blood, come and feed on me. So all these ectoparasites are able to detect those and then sort of make use of them. I also wanted to talk a little bit about decomposers. I hope that's okay. Uh, just a quick kind of rundown on them. Uh, I won't show any super gross pictures. This is the grossest one here, the maggots on the right. But there's a lot of insects that use rotting material as oviposition sites. They want to lay their eggs there because things like maggots or other larvae use those rotting substances for sustenance. And uh, in most instances, we're talking about flies. Flies like this blowfly are able to detect the chemicals of death, quote unquote, these smells that start to emit from a, a, a corpse very quickly after death. These insects often arrive within hours, sometimes even like 30 minutes of something expiring because those, those odors start to leak out from the dead thing, they're able to detect it with those aerostate antenna and they fly right towards it. The female flies that do this are often ready to oviposit. There was a cool paper that came out a couple of years ago that showed females who have recently mated and are ready to lay their eggs, they are most primed in to be able to smell a chemical called dimethyl trisulfide, DMTS, one of these death chemicals and they're able to pick that up very quickly. They fly to that potential host, and then they see specific cues. They can tell the difference between the dead thing and the grass or soil around it by looking for colors like black and red and brown, which usually indicate animal fur, animal pelts, or a wound, and they're able to sort of orient towards that and then land, and they'll pick up more of those smell chemicals with their feet and mouth, and they know that this is an area that they want to lay their eggs in. We actually utilize this biology to our own ends through forensic entomology, the colonization of a dead body, uh, either human or other animal, follows a sequence of events where flies show up, then different species of beetles show up, ending with things like uh, carpet beetles or, or domestic beetles, and uh, then all of those things are able to be sort of sequenced by an entomologist. And you can say, okay, it's most likely that this body's been here for X amount of time. You can also just simply find the maggots and rear them up in conditions similar to what you found them in. And you can create a timeline where you can say, okay, this person was likely dead for 72 hours before we found them, which can help in these different criminal investigations. So not only do they use it, we use these chemical, uh, these chemical pickup methods as well. So that's the answer, Renee. That's how they find you. That's how they know that you're delicious. Uh, they're able to smell these chemicals coming off of you. So basically, is bug spray just masking my Precisely. Oh, yeah, okay. when you talk about insect repellents, that repellent part is, is very important terminology. Uh, that's why when people say, oh, I'm spraying myself with bug spray, I always try to be very specific and say, no, you're using an insect repellent, not just because I'm a pedantic scientist, but because there's a difference. Insecticides kill bugs. Repellents, on the other hand, 
they create this mask where you don't smell good anymore. DEET smells very bad to them, so they're not able to find you. I also wanted to ask Renee, uh, you don't have to tell me necessarily since it's a recorded <laughs> thing, but what's your blood type? Um, it is B negative. B negative. Okay. So you typically would be considered kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, mosquitoes love type O blood. They can actually detect that blood type. Uh, that's yeah. their preferred one. B is in the middle. A is their least favorite. So it doesn't uh, matter whether it's one way or the other. Cause I know mine's like the most, the one that most people don't have. So okay. <laughs> I was like, great. <laughs> well, the other thing is that 85% uh, of people are capable of producing a smell that that chemically communicates what your blood type is, 15% of people don't. So I've met some, some type O people that say, oh, well, I never get bit by mosquitoes. And they probably hit the lottery again and are in that small 15%. That would be uh, nice. The more activity you're doing outside, uh, the larger you are, if you're pregnant, all of these can contribute to more CO2 that attracts mosquitoes. Uh, and we haven't figured this out yet, but there is data that shows just consuming one beer creates something in you that makes you more attractive to mosquitoes, but we can't tell <laughs> what it is. Uh, I like to think it's that, you know, they want to crack a cold one at the end of the day as well. But, uh, <laughs> not sure. We're flying all day and hunting for food. So <laughs> yeah. now as far as spraying, do you need to like spray all around you to keep them off of you? Or is it okay if you just had a little bit, will that deter them enough that they don't like it? If you're using a repellent, I, I encourage you to think about exposed skin. So if you've got short sleeves on, do in your arms, uh, do the backs of your legs around your ankles. Uh, that way, if ticks are crawling, they will be repelled as well, hopefully. Uh, just anywhere that's kind of exposed. Yeah, you don't want to just do like the perfume spritz. That yeah. will help, but you do want some coverage. You, don't, you also don't want to be dripping with it when right. you get done. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we did have some questions. Um, what would you suggest if you find Japanese beetles in your garden? You, you I, so part of what I was hinting at here, I, I should have closed the loop on that and I apologize, is that if you go out in the evening and you find beetles on your plants, take a bucket of soapy water and tap the beetles into it. And as you do that over the course of three to seven days, the less damage your plant receives, the fewer beetles will be recruited to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you actually end up sort of eliminating that, that host finding behavior from, from them. Mm -hmm. And you haven't had to put out any pesticides for it necessarily. So that would be my recommendation, especially for a garden where you can usually get around and go to all the plants. It doesn't take a lot of time, mm -hmm. but that would be my recommendation. The other thing would be to treat them with some sort of, of product. Uh, there are organic options like neem and pyrethrin that have to be applied multiple times, but we can do these, these physical removals as well. And it, it works just as well. All right, great. Well, someone said that their blood type is A positive and they pick them out of a crowd. So, <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it is about you, but uh, maybe you, you have a lot of lactic acid leaking off of you. I apologize. I wish that you uh, fell into the lucky group right. of A, a, a <laughs> blood types. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. I always uh, really enjoy your segments. Um, we hope we always learn a lot. And um, so I, I'm sure we'll I know we're going to have you on again for creepy things from the forest. Oh, yes. it's, our, it's spooky yeah, time soon. <laughs> time. Exactly. So I greatly appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone. You know, we've had a we've covered a lot of ground. Now you know why certain insects like you, <laughs> or maybe they don't. Um, and we've also found out about the deer disease. And hopefully you know more about black walnuts and why uh, hopefully that you don't think hopefully your trees aren't dying, that it's just something that they're doing this time of year. So if you could, um, if you want any kind of topics whatsoever that you'd like to suggest, go ahead and go to fromthewoodstoday.com. And that will, um, we have a little survey there that you can suggest any topics whatsoever. Um, but um, if you don't want to do that, you just want to watch our show every week. We appreciate that as well. Um, and you can just join us on Wednesdays of every week at 11 o'clock. Until then, take care. Bye. From the woods today